If you want to start reading Thomas Pynchon, there's a lot of videos on YouTube that'll give you an idea of where to start. And most of these videos come to the same conclusions. That's not really that surprising. There's only eight possible answers. But for me, the question of where to start with Pynchon is so wrapped up in the answer to another question, which is, what do you expect to get out of it? And there's three possible answers to that question. The first is, I just want the overview. I want to know what all the fuss is about. And if that's the reason you want to start reading Thomas Pynchon, then I would recommend you start with this. This is The Crying A Lot 49. It's a story of a woman who finds out she might have a mysterious inheritance waiting. And as she tracks it down, she runs into all the things that Thomas Pynchon is famous for. The zany characters, the possible conspiracies, there's a secret postal service. And so if you read The Crying of Lot 49, you're going to get that overview of all the themes that made Thomas Pynchon such a hit and such an important figure in American literature. But maybe that's not what you're looking for. Maybe what you're looking for is the book that's most likely to make you read another book by Thomas Pynchon. And if that's you, then I would recommend you start with this. This is Inherent Vice, and it's got a lot of the same things that I love about The Crying A Lot 49. It's about a character named Doc Sportello. He's a private eye, and so right there you're in a familiar genre. You're going to feel like this book is part of a world that you understand. Doc Sportello is asked by a number of different people to coincidentally solve a bunch of different mysteries that all revolve around the disappearance of this real estate developer. And to do that, he's got to get involved with the woman who left him, his old friends on the police department, who he has this love-hate, frenemy kind of relationship with. And he runs into all the things that the woman from The Crying A Lot 49 runs into. The shadowy conspiracies, the weird countercultural references. Over and over again, we see how counterculture gets co-opted by consumer culture at a speed which makes it almost impossible for people to live an authentic life. But the real reason that I recommend, if you need that gateway drug to Thomas Pynchon, that you start with Inherent Vice, is really simple. There's a great movie based on this book. I would have thought it was unfilmable, but Paul Thomas Anderson did a great job with it. Yes, there's a lot of things in the book that aren't in the movie, notably the invention of the internet, which really puts this melancholy period on the novel. But it, for me, I read this book. I said, gosh, I think I get it. I think I understand it. And then I went and watched the movie and I said, my gosh, I did. That was pretty much the way I saw it too. That was the feeling I got. And that gave me the confidence that I needed to go and pick up something different. There's a third thing that you might be looking for out of Thomas Pynchon. And that's if you're a completist. That's if you're someone who says, you know, this is the year that I'm going to tackle all these books. I'm going to read all eight of them. I just need to know which one to hit first. And if that's you, I have kind of a non-traditional suggestion for you. And that is to read them chronologically, not by the year in which they came out, but as a history of America. If you're doing that, well, you'd start with this book. This is, this is Mason and Dixon. This is probably personally my favorite Thomas Pynchon novel, but it's a bit of a side project. It's sort of a meta novel about not just the characters involved, but about the act of storytelling. It takes place hundreds of years ago. This reverend is trying to earn a seat at the table at this rich people's home over Christmas. And to do that, he tells them the story of the explorers, Mason and Dixon, and their adventures charting America when it was just barely even a country. And as he does that, he changes the story from page to page based on who he thinks needs to be told, hey, pay a little attention here. You know, is it their kids in the room or their adults in the room? And sometimes the story becomes incredibly modern. It's because he's saying, hey, I know that you, modern reader, are also a character and somebody who I need to keep interested in this story. But if you read this, you're looking at that moment when America could have been almost anything. And to me, that's what Pynchon did better than almost anybody. He didn't look at the big events of American history. Instead, he looked at the elbows in time, where we actually defined this country, and then asked, why over and over again did we seem to make the wrong decision? So if you start with Mason and Dixon, you can go from there. From there, you go to Against the Day. This is his mega novel. Look at this thing. Against the Day, super thick. That's because everything is in here because it's a turn-of-the-century novel. It's got the spy stories. It's got the anarchists, the bombings, the cowboys. Everything seems to be happening at once because that must be how it felt at the turn of the century. 
So that's your turn of the century novel. From there, you go to Gravity's Rainbow. This is the book that made him famous. It is also the hardest of his books to read. It's almost impenetrable, but what it's about is really pretty simple. In the days following World War II, the Allies searched the demilitarized zone between England and Germany, looking for this rumored powerful German rocket. That's it. That's what's going on in this book. And over the course of it, he really starts to show what this did to the world. The idea that after this massive war and after the dropping of the nuclear bomb, how we had to reset our expectations of what we were and what modern life was. So if that's the 40s, then you can get to the 50s with V. This was the one that was hardest for me personally. And that was because it was the one where he brought modern life and our past history as a culture together in the shape of a V, showing how the past shaped us in those years following World War II. So there's your 50s. From there, you can get to the beginning of the 60s and crying a lot 49 that I already talked about. And then the end of the 60s, the death of that era, an inherent vice. And move from there to Vineland. So this book happens in the 80s. It's about a girl trying to figure out why it is that the feds seem to have it in for her lovable hippie dad. To me, this is the saddest book by Thomas Pynchon. When it came out, a lot of people said it was Pynchon Light or it was really easy to get through. I'm sure compared to Gravity's Rainbow, it was. But gosh, this is a heartbreaking novel. It's very focused on that one story and how it reflects the American story. There's your 80s book. And then from there, you get to the 90s, the turn of the century, the beginning uh, of the internet, and of course the events of 9-11. And so what you've just done is seen the history of America through the eyes of Thomas Pynchon. And if I could go back and do it again, that's how I would have read these, in sequence, by where they land in our nation's history.